I discovered John Stott uh, in my father's library. He was a Christian layman and he would get the compendia of the Urbana Missionary Conference at which uh, John Stott often gave the Bible expositions. And um, reading that, I got a taste of Bible exposition, uh, which became my preferred style of preaching. Uh, around this time, I also uh, discovered a book, The Preacher's Portrait. I read it slowly. Uh, I was considering the ministry at that time. Uh, and um, I found over several months, I read it very slowly. And it was one of the most influential books in my life. Uh, it, it told me what a servant of God should be like. And that opened a door to another of the major contributions that John Stott had on my life, which was it gave a model of looking at issues out of a biblical perspective. Um, this was an aspect of his emphasis on the preacher being a bridge builder. Uh, you interact with the culture out of a biblical base and you apply biblical truth to contemporary issues. From his pen, or I should say pencil, uh, came several other classic statements, such as issues facing today, I believe in preaching, and the cross of Christ. I have tried to use this approach in responding to some of the issues the church in Sri Lanka uh, faces. I still remember the impact of the exposition on 2 Timothy 2.7 that John Stott did at the Urbana 1967 conference. That verse says, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. I began to realize that teaching and preaching involves hard the hard work of seeking to understand what the author meant think over what I say, and also dependence on God through prayer to help us understand. The Lord will give you understanding in everything. Stott, I don't know whether John Stott said this, uh, but, but the idea that I got is that study involved perspiration and inspiration. I must work hard to understand what the scriptures say with an attitude of receptivity to God's leading. Perspiration and inspiration, of course, are interrelated. Study drives us to prayer. We want to know what the inspired author meant. We feel inadequate and plead for God's help. Study is an actually an expression of our respect for the Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures. We want to take what he said seriously. We want to find out what he meant. But we also acknowledge our weakness and inadequacy. So we work hard to find the truth and depend on God. Depending on God, of course, opens the door to grace. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12 expounds this beautifully, culminating in verse 12 with the statement, For when I am weak, I am strong. Preachers then are weak people who work hard to study God's truth while always depending on God's guidance. By now, I had been convinced that God has called me uh, to be a minister and um, I resolved that my ministry will involve careful study and earnest prayer. The more I read John Stott, the more I realized the implications of 2 Timothy 2.7. Christians value truth and are careful about how they handle it. Or as Paul put it a few verses later in verse 15 of 2 Timothy 2. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. I met John Stott two years after I had returned to Sri Lanka from theological studies and um, at a conference. The first question he asked me was, are you giving time to study? 
This approach of careful and prayerful study is sorely needed today. We are driven by the fact that God has spoken through his word. We humbly submit to it because we believe that it comes from the creator of the universe. Isaiah 66 and verse 2 talks about the attitude that is required of us. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Many today consider submission to God and his word as a violation of a human right. We have a right to determine our way of life, they say, according to our desires and inclinations. Those desires and inclinations have become an essential feature of their identity and denying that is considered an assault on the person, on his or her identity. Because God has been rejected or ignored, God's word, the fact that God's word uh, opposes those things is irrelevant. What to us then is temptation to avoid, to others is a desire to be embraced. Romans 1, 18 to 32 describes this process where people gave up an attitude of submission to God and the door was opened to various deviant lifestyles so that what the Bible calls sin is considered an authentic alternate lifestyle. Uh, they say that the Christian approach to truth subjects people to bondage and unjust rules that deny their humanness. For us, of course, living under the scriptures is not bondage, but the path to freedom. As Jesus said in John 8, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. People who love the Bible view the word as a delight, as the psalmists often said. Yet, presenting the gospel based on truth to people who see truth as bondage is a challenge in today's world. Even in the evangelical community, uh, we have not escaped this lax approach to truth. Conscientious, sometimes laborious, pursuit of trying to find, study God's word is scoffed at in some circles. It's considered a denial of dependence on the Holy Spirit. Theology is considered a hindrance to an exciting life. To evangelicals, truth is profoundly serious. Therefore, we should be careful about how we handle it. But recently, we are seeing a carelessness with regard to truth. For example, in social media, where it is possible to give instant uh, reactions to issues, people have become lazy to give thoughtful responses to issues. Christians are defending convictions using doubtful means. They may not be sure of a, a particular explanation, but they pass it on and later it is labeled as fake news. Sometimes they are not sure whether it's fake news, so they will add a prescript when they forward this news, forwarded as received. If you are not sure, why forward it? A carelessness about truth. The Bible is very strongly condemnatory of false witness. But today we find Christians espousing conspiracy theories, though they are not sure of their veracity. If it buttresses their conviction of what is orthodoxy, they think it is worth propagating, even though they are not sure whether it's true. And of course, unscrupulous people create stories which are not true, knowing that they will catch on. And Christians are duped into believing and they forward these letters. This lightness with, with which truth is handled is a sign of the devaluing of truth. The idea is, well, if it's wrong, so be it. It's not a big deal. Then take this phenomenon of prophecies which are in vogue today. 
prophecies are sometimes given to buttress a political stance. Sometimes they are given to fulfill uh, as an indication that the dreams of people are going to be fulfilled, such as the success of a certain venture. And people are blessed by these prophecies. It feels good to hear things uh, you like to hear. But some of these prophecies are not fulfilled. Unfulfilled prophecy was found right through history. But today what's alarming is that people conveniently forget when the prophecy is not fulfilled. It's not a big deal. In the Old Testament, uh, the death penalty was decreed in Deuteronomy 18 verses 20 to 22 uh, to those who gave wrong prophecies. Why? Because prophecies claim to be God's word. And God's word is desperately important. But the flippant response to unfulfilled prophecies today shows that Christians have got careless about truth. The response then to fake news and false prophecy is, re is re resulting in devaluing one of the great pillars of Christianity, which is its foundation in truth. Our generation is careless about truth. We may give birth to a next generation which not, does not believe in the validity or the necessity of truth. A century ago, anti-supernaturalism gave birth to a dark age of liberalism in the church. Could carelessness about truth in this century give birth to a dark age of truthless Christianity. At the Cape Town Lausanne 2 convention in 2010, Os Guinness said, Christians who are careless about truth are as wrong and as foolish and as dangerous as the worst skeptics and scoffers of our time. John Stott's approach to truth has always challenged me to be careful about truth. John Stott also demonstrated not only the primacy of truth, but also the beauty of truth. Not only the authority of our proclamation, but also the humility of the proclaimer. He displayed what I might call a quiet confidence in the truth. A confidence that comes from belief in the nature of the word. 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25 says, uh, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Today, we see a completely different approach to truth. But we don't need to throw up our hands in despair. We see opposition to the unflinching assertion of the truths of the gospel. But we don't need to back down and compromise on truth. What we need is humble proclaimers of the truth who have done their homework and now present it with quiet confidence in the truth. Let me um, mention five truths that lie behind this quiet confidence. Firstly, Belief in the truthfulness of scripture and from a careful study of it. In this age of confusion, we can proclaim the word with certainty because it's God's word. Secondly, we know that the word of God meets, uh, this is the word of the creator which meets the deepest needs of his creation. Even the needs of those who are most resistant to this word. Not only is it true, it is also relevant. It's exactly what they need to hear because it comes from the one who created them. Thirdly, we go out of an attitude of prayer and a knowledge that God has sent us. He is the one who called us to this work. We are on assignment with a mandate from him. Fourthly, 
the world may not be impressed by boring recitation of facts. That would reinforce the idea that truth results in bondage. Instead, the Holy Spirit kindles a fire in our hearts and brings our words, brings fire to our words so that they are powerful and able to change lives. Five, when we speak, ultimately it's the Holy Spirit who's at work. He convinces people of the truth. We do our part as best as we can and leave the rest to him. This is the basis of our confidence. It prevents us from giving up. It also prevents us from giving in to the bitter hostility that has become associated with what is called fundamentalism, which is really a uh, uh, really uh, coming out of insecurity that makes them angry at their opponent. We love our opponents. It prevents us from being diffident like those who don't believe in the absolute uniqueness of God's revelation. God has spoken to his creation and we are bearers of this message and the Holy Spirit speaks through us so we can go with quiet confidence. Let me say one more thing. The contemporary distaste for living under the authority of truth would brand authoritative preaching as arrogant. But there is no place for arrogance in Christian proclamation. The authority of the preacher is the authority of being hidden behind Christ. We preach with authority because we know it's true. As for ourselves, we are so enraptured by Christ and what he has done for us that we are not going to waste time uh, and energy boosting ourselves, trying to show how good we are. We cannot look down on others and be arrogant because we know that we are dependent on grace. There is no place for arrogance in Christian proclamation. Rather, filled with the love of Christ, with confidence in the truth of the gospel, we have the strength to be servants of people. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants. Jesus is the only Lord and we are but servants of the people whom he sends us to. I served on the drafting committee of the document that came out of the Lausanne II conference in Manila in 1989. John Stott was asked to uh, write the basic document to come out of the conference and he was given the assignment at the last moment. He was virtually forced into doing it. He had to stay up night after night, work very hard and somehow he managed to come up with a document and present it during the conference to the drafting committee. We uh, looked at it, edited it, and presented it to the, um, to the general body of the conference. There, there was a strong push to do away with this whole document uh, and just come up with some basic affirmations. We debated this proposal and didn't come up with an agreement and we adjourned for the day. The next day, John Stott came and at the start of our meeting, he said, I have grappled with God over this issue into the night. And I want to tell you that I'm willing to scrap the document that we produced and, uh, and go with the short uh, affirmations. Fortunately, the committee decided to keep it. They had the basic affirmations at the start and kept the longer document later on. And that became the Manila Manifesto. It showed me the character of a servant. He was willing to surrender all the hard work he had sacrificially done if that was the wish of the committee. The great John Stott chose to be a servant of us lesser mortals on the committee. 
People today are living in a maze of uncertainty concerning the truth. The winsome, confident witness of Christians who are humble servants of people could be a breath of fresh air in this environment and it could commend the truth about Jesus to people. We always associated John Stott with winsome authority combined with humble servanthood. May God raise up more and more such authoritative and humble servants of the people.